to just say real quickly, thank you so much uh, to all of you for making us feel so, so welcome here. And to your pastors, you guys are a blessed people. Amen. Amen. You know that? You are a blessed people. We've had the opportunity to travel around and get to go to quite a few churches and um, I've been to a lot of churches of friends, friends of friends, and it is, it's special when you go to a place and you have pastors like you have. So we thank you guys so much for inviting us and for having us here. It's only with Jesus can you meet someone and just be in love with them. <laughs> and you meet people that have the same kindred spirit and just, it's a, it's, we love you guys. We genuinely do. And we love all of you too. And thank you for having us here today. Uh, before I share, before I minister anything, Emily's going to sing a song for us. So uh, let's welcome her. I'm singing the song Goodness of God uh, just a minute ago. It actually was a song that me and my siblings sang at my father's funeral about he passed away three years ago. Wow. So it brought <laughs> that song. I just, it brings tears to my eyes because God has been so good. And if there's one thing that I would like you guys to just, just to tell you this morning is um, he is good and he will see you through the storm. No matter what it is that you're going through this morning, Christ alone can keep you in the storm and take you through it. And I'm going to sing that song this morning called Cornerstone. And um, I'm a living proof. It was the hardest thing I've ever gone through, losing my dad. And three years later, I can tell you, he's been with my family, with me, through that storm. And he carried us through. So no matter what it is that you're facing this morning... Whatever the storm is, he can see you through it as long as you keep your faith in him and you just keep on holding on to him. Amen. Amen.
you've built your life on him, if that cornerstone has come and you've established your life on that cornerstone, Christ and him crucified, because of who he is and because of what he's done, he deserves all the glory of our life. He deserves it and he's worthy of it this morning. So turn with me over to the book of Daniel. We're going to be taking our text this morning from Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. While you're turning there, I just want to again say thank you so much for having me here and for having my wife, Emily. Um, I think she's pretty. I don't know who called me pretty, but <laughs> we're going <laughs> to, we'll talk after. <laughs> but uh, we do appreciate you guys inviting us and welcoming us so, so graciously. It's really, really appreciated. Uh, we have two little kids we left at home this weekend. Our, our daughter, Hallie, is two. She's almost three. And uh, she's just, I love her so much. And then we have a crazy little child who's 18 months old, my son Caleb, who walks around with a golf club everywhere he goes and hits everything he sees. So th that's, that's our life right now. And right now it's my brother's life because he's watching them this weekend. So we called them. They said, oh, you're checking in on kids? I said, no, I'm checking in on Shane, seeing if my brother's okay here. <laughs> But we are, we are so glad to be here this morning. But uh, have you found your place in Daniel chapter 3? If you're there, could you say amen? Amen. All right, so we're going to be talking about a very familiar story, or at least starting here with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego cast into the fiery furnace. And the story really makes up the entirety of this chapter. So unless you want to hear me read the whole chapter, we're just going to kind of skip through a few verses here, some key verses that bring out some key points here. At this time, the children of Israel are in Babylonian captivity. So Israel has fallen to Babylon. They've been taken away captives, and they are positioned in Babylon right now with King Nebuchadnezzar reigning there. 
And Nebuchadnezzar establishes an idol and says, when you hear the music play and you hear the sound of the music, everyone under the sound of that music needs to bow before this idol and worship. Three Hebrew boys said, we're not bowing. We will not bow. And in verse 8 it says, therefore certain Chaldeans came forward to accuse the Jews. So they spoke to King Nebuchadnezzar and they told him in verse 12, there's certain Jews, watch this, whom you have placed over the affairs of the province of Babylon. So there, there's a hint of jealousy here too. Not only are these these Jews, they're the ones you put in charge of us. Wow. Same thing ends up happening with Daniel later on in his life when he's thrown into the lion's den. It was jealousy because God's hand was on their life. Look, God can put his hand on your life no matter where you go. David said, I can make my bed in hell and you are there with me. You can, wherever you are, if you are firmly placed on that rock, on that foundation, my God can, favor will follow. And that's what they have found, favor here. And they said, King, they don't have any regard for you or for your gods. Verse 15, it says, Now, if you are ready, this is King Nebuchadnezzar talking to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He says, I'm going to give you a second chance. If you're ready at the time you hear the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, the psalter, the symphony of all kinds of musics, music, and you fall down and worship the image I've made, good, good. I'm giving you a second chance. I'm so gracious. But if you do not worship, you're going to be cast immediately into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God? Who's the God that will deliver you from my hands? And these three boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, say, Oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need time to think about this. I don't need your second chances here. I don't need a second chance to see if I'm going to follow Jesus. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and He will deliver us from your hand. But if not... I don't care if he shows up or not, I'm not bowing before your idol. He's still worthy, not because of what he does and shows up to do right now, but because of who he is and the fact that he is king of glory. I will worship him. So if not, let it be known, O king, we do not serve your gods. We will not serve your gods. We will not worship this golden image that you have set up. And he is enraged. Tells his people, turn the furnace up seven times. Kick that thing up. Verse 22 is where we're going to pick up and finish out here. Reading, therefore, because the king's command was urgent, the furnace exceedingly hot, the flames thereof killed those men who took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So the men that Nebuchadnezzar told to grab them and bind them and throw them in, they die. But God's children don't. Oh, man, I'm, I'm going to leave that. I'm going to leave it. No, I won't. <laughs> the fire can get turned up, and God is able to protect us right there. Though a thousand fall at my right hand and ten thousand at my left, my God is able to keep me here in the midst of it. <laughs> King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished. He rose up in haste and he spoke, saying to the counselors, Did we not cast three men in, bound into the midst of the fire? Yes, it's true, king. Look, he answered, I see four men loosed, walking around in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Wow. Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the burning furnace, and he spoke, saying, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God. Look at how quick his tune changed. Who is the God that will deliver you? Now he's saying, this is the God, the one true God. Come out and come here. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the midst of the fire, and the administrators, governors, kings, counselors gathered together, and they saw these men that, whose bodies the fire had no power. The hair on their head was not singed, their garments not affected. Even the smell of the fire was not on them. If I get within 100 feet of a bonfire, I smell like smoke. These guys stood in the midst of the furnace and didn't even smell like smoke. In verse 28, 
Nebuchadnezzar speaks and says, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Sent his angel to deliver his servants who trusted in him, and they have frustrated the king's word, yielded their bodies, that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own. Therefore, I make a decree. Any people, nation, language which speaks anything amiss against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, watch this, they will be cut in pieces and their houses shall be made an ash heap. So instead of burning them, he now says, anyone who doesn't follow this god will burn your house. Then the king, final verse, promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What a story. What a story we have here of God showing up and delivering his people. But it starts with people who say, I'm planted on this foundation and I'm not moving. On Christ the solid rock, I am planted and I'm not moving. And I want to share with you a message this morning that I I believe is uh, applicable for every one of us regardless of what season of life you're in, where you find yourself, I want you to leave this place this morning knowing two things. First and foremost, He is with you. Jesus Christ is with you. And secondly, if He is with you, He deserves glory in your life. Amen. So I want to share with you a message simply entitled, He is with you. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we love you so much this morning, God, and we thank you for your presence in this place. Lord, for your people that have gathered together, Lord, to just worship your name, that the name of Jesus be lifted up in this house this morning, God. And we ask you that that name continue to be lifted up here. Lord, touch your people, Father. Anoint us to hear, Lord. Anoint us to to take your word and to understand it in a better way this morning and to take it out into the streets and into our lives and live it out so that you can get glory through our lives. You deserve every bit of it, Father, for what you've done for us at Calvary. You deserve the glory through our lives. So we ask it, Lord, in the name of Jesus and pray, amen and amen. It was about 1997, a little while ago now, I was in second grade. And in second grade, I don't know who this kid is or what happened to him, I was straight-A student, very good student, and in fact, won best dressed that year because I wore a clip-on Mickey Mouse tie every time I went to school. (laughs) Pictures that no one will ever see there. (laughs) That kid didn't last long, though, so by ninth grade, I had very different friends with very different uh, priority systems, and my priorities were not where they should have been at this time, and the only A I was getting by ninth grade was in gym class. So in English, one time I was writing a paper, and I wrote this paper, I turned it in, a couple days later, my teacher came to me and said, hey, I need to see you after class. I thought I was in trouble, and I went there and she said, look, I, wanna, uh, I want you to go into an AP writing class, like an advanced writing class. And I thought, I can't spell. <laughs> but I went down because I got to miss class. So I went down to the library, And I walk in, and there's, I thought 30, 40 people would be there. There was like five. And I walk in, and this kid looked up so quickly at me that his glasses fell off. And he had to push them up, and he said, what are you doing here, Sean? And I said, you're right. And I walked out. (laughs) What that teacher kept encouraging me with, though, was this. Though I couldn't spell, though I hated reading, and though nothing bores me more than talking about grammar, I love the organization of a good story. I love the structure of a good story. I love a movie that has a good storyline, right? And everything ties together and it just comes together, right? And there's no better story than the book that we just read out of. There is no better story than the Bible front to cover. No better storyline, no better, nothing, Hollywood can, if they would just take this and make a movie, gosh, better than anything you could ever write. But I love the progression of a good story. So by the time we get here with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I want to take us on a little journey this morning. Can we do that? We're going to start back a little bit, a little bit, several hundred years before this and work our way up to the place where they are in captivity in Babylon. You with me? Everybody's good? We're going to take a journey this morning. So let's go back to when God first promised them the land of Israel. How many... 
have heard this, and, and throughout my life, I know I've heard it, I have said it. God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees, and that's when his people were supposed to go to Canaan. If you go back and read Genesis chapter 11, though, at the end of chapter 11, it was actually Abraham's dad, Terah, that God spoke to. God told Terah, get up and get your family and go to the land of Canaan, which I shall show you. What is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob could be the God of Terah, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. See, what you do with God's voice and God's direction matters. Amen. When God calls you and tells you go somewhere, when God gives you direction, it matters if you're obedient. Amen. And he was partially obedient. He got up out of Ur, which is over here, and Canaan over here, and there's a desert between them. So they had to walk up around the desert. So they get up to Haran, which is two-thirds of the way there. He's almost to the promised land. And he has family there. And virtually every scholar in, in the Jewish culture says that in Haran, Terah backslid into idolatry. He wasn't supposed to stop it there. He was supposed to go to God's promised land. He wasn't supposed to stop there. But he gets rooted with his family, and every historian and every Jewish historian believes that's where he backslid into idolatry and died lost. Then chapter 12 starts, and God says, Abraham, get up out of where your family is, where your dad just died in idolatry, and get to the land that I will show you. Get away from your family. And he says, okay, and he gets up with Sarah, and he brings his nephew Lot. And hundreds of other people with him. Again, not clear obedience, right? We have a partial obedience that causes difficulty down the road. Because he gets to Canaan, and there's a famine in the land. And this is so beautiful. Watch this. There's a famine in the land, and every inhabitant in the land, the Bible says, leaves the promised land. Look at that. He follows God, goes to where he's supposed to be. God sends a famine and casts every enemy out of the land. This is what Abraham had to do to inhabit the promised land. Just go. Just get there and stand still. Famine comes and everyone would have left. Boom, promised land inhabited. <laughs> Instead, he has to leave and flee to Egypt, and I wonder if it's because he's got hundreds of mouths to feed that he should have left in Haran. See, stop trying to hold on to something from seasons in your past that shouldn't be going with you to the next season that you're going to. Stop trying to cling on to things, relationships, people that should be left in Haran. If God is calling you to move forward somewhere, if God is leading you somewhere, you must be willing to just go. Hear his voice and follow. I have to wonder if it's all those extra mouths to feed that made it more difficult than it was to stay during the famine. He heads to Egypt, and as time goes on, we have a promise in Genesis 15 where God says, through your seed, your descendants will outnumber the, the grains of sand on the seashore, the stars in the sky, and through your lineage, all the nations of the world will be blessed. Literally, the Messiah is going to come through your lineage. This promised son, Isaac, comes. Isaac has Jacob. Jacob has Joseph and if you're familiar with the story, Joseph sold by his brothers into slavery into Egypt. Good family relationship. When they all come to Egypt, though, and for a season, it's good in Egypt. For a season, there's nothing wrong with, with the inhabitants. I mean, Joseph's second in command over the whole nation. Nothing wrong there. But as a few years pass, a uh, pharaoh arises, and uh, somebody mentioned it yesterday, that had did not remember, did not know, literally means has no regard for who Joseph is. And the children of God become slaves for hundreds of years. Hundreds of years until they cry out unto the Lord, and the Bible says that God heard their cry and remembered his promise to Abraham. It's not that he had forgot, it's the people had forgot. They cry and God remembers his, his promise, sends them a deliverer, Moses, and it's so great. Pharaoh wants to kill all the children two years old and younger. That's not the great part. This is. While he wants to kill all these young boys, they hide Moses in a basket and send him down the river. 
right? Pharaoh's daughter finds Moses, brings him into her house, and Moses' sister Miriam says, hey, if you want somebody to wean the child and take care of the baby, I know someone who might be interested. She says, that's so great. What a good idea. Take the kid. In fact, I will pay you to take the kid. So watch this. Pharaoh pays Moses' mom to raise the deliverer which will destroy his kingdom. <laughs> this is what God can do. He can make your enemy have to pay for the deliverer to be raised up. What a good God. What a good God. So Pharaoh's paying, thinking, oh, this is great. We found this kid. And God's saying, yeah, it's great. He's going to destroy your grip upon my people. Ten plagues later, at the Red Sea, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And the waters are parted and they move forward. And you would think after everything they just saw, my God, now finally we're going to walk in Canaan. On the brink of it, on the cusp of it, ten or twelve spies are sent into the land. Go and look at the land that we're about to inhabit. Hundreds of years have passed. We're so close. And you're familiar. Ten spies come back. I mean, the grapes from the land took two men to carry them back. One cluster of grapes. And while Joshua and Caleb come back and say, the enemy is bred for us, the ten spies come back with a negative report saying, we can't handle the giants in the land. You just... You just saw God turn the water of Egypt to blood. Nets, frogs, hail. As soon as the plagues start mentioning death, go back and look at it. I think it's like the fourth or fifth plague. Once death is mentioned, God starts separating his people from the others. And it, it increases more and more until the, last, until the ninth plague with darkness, where there is darkness covering the face of Egypt, but there's light in Goshen. Hallelujah. You just saw all of that, and now you're scared of a giant. He just covered a nation with darkness, and you're scared because he's a foot taller than you. Maybe three or four. <laughs> and they convince the whole people to walk in unbelief, and for 40 years they wander in a wilderness until an entire generation of unbelief dies in a wilderness. Then comes Joshua. We're getting there. We're getting to our story. Joshua stands at the Jordan River and God says, send the priest first. Type of Christ. Carry the ark and send the priest into the water. The waters part and they come to the first place and now we are finally here. We've crossed the river. We are finally at Canaan. We're finally about to take the land. And he says, wait, send two spies into Jericho, the first city that we have to fight against. Consider this. Hundreds of years have passed. Abraham has died. Isaac has died. Jacob has died. Joseph has died. Moses has died. God has done great things providing for them, great things delivering them. All of this time has passed and has been building to this point where we stand at Jericho. And God says, hold on, hold on, hold on. There's someone in the city praying. Two spies go into a house of a woman named Rahab, and the most important thing on the face of the earth, hundreds of years in the making, is God's people taking the promised land. Right? Hundreds of years in the making, building to this point, and God says, hold on, hold on. In a sinful city, amongst sinful people, a harlot is praying. One harlot puts a stop to the most important thing on the face of the earth. My God, we got to be careful how we value people in this life. A soul was worth the blood of Jesus. One soul is worth the blood of Jesus, and I don't care what they look like or sound like to you and to me. One soul was worth the blood of Jesus. And God says, hold on, hold on. There's a heart here that's crying out for redemption, and I'll put a stop to the most important thing in the world if it means to save one soul. So the first group of people that I want to talk to today and want to mention today, he is with you, is those who have been walking in sin, those who you know your life is not right with God. If you'll cry out to him, he put a stop 
to the inhabiting of the promised land to save one. And he'll come and save you today. If we'll cry out to him, the first group of people that he will be there for are those in sin that are looking for a redeemer. Crying out for a redeemer. The story proceeds and they take the promised land and under Joshua's leadership they take much of the promised land. Then the judges come and the people cry out, well, we want a king. All the other nations have a king. We want a king. Well, this king's going to be terrible. He's going to devour you and devour your people. We don't care. We just want a king. <laughs> this, how, how often do we pray like that? God, I just want this. I, I did that one time. Mm. I've done that many times. One time. One time in my life. No, there was a specific time where I'd just gotten saved, and I was on a hockey team at the time with my brother, with a lot of my friends. We were really a good team, and we were a team. I mean, there was, everyone was good, but we didn't view it as like superstar status or anything. Everyone was just a team. Well, at the time, they were making a professional team. This was in inline hockey. For the summers, you would play, I played ice hockey throughout the winters, inline in the summers, and they had tournaments where you could play for money. And I thought, if I could win this tournament, one of them was worth $50,000. And I'm 19 years old and was like, all right, I'll go play hockey if that's, you know. And they were building a new team, and I was praying, newly saved, saying, God, just put me on the team. God, just put me on the team. But then at the end, I was like, if it's your will, but put me on the team. And then, if it's okay with you, but seriously, you need to do this, God. <laughs> How often we pray like that? This is what you need to do, Lord, but only if it's your will. So sometimes God will give you what you're asking for just to show you you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> he did, and I, I'm, I don't regret that time. It was still, you know, I still had met good people and had good times, but I look back and I wish to God that I would have just stayed with my family, my friends, and we ended up, we were better than the team I went to. It was just the enticement of free equipment and maybe making money. <laughs> but a lot of times we'll pray like that is, Lord, this is what I want. And that's what the children of Israel, God, just give us Saul. We want Saul. Saul ends up demon-possessed, demon uh, tormented by demon spirits, and God says, I'm going to take the kingdom from him and give it to a man named David. And we know David's life is exemplified, his life is exemplified by great highs, great lows. And we're going to talk about Bathsheba in a second and Uriah, but really one of the lowest points in David's life is not there. It's he ends up the teenage boy who threw a stone at Goliath's face, hit him in the forehead, and delivered God's people, ends up in the Philistine army. 16 months running from God, ends up in the enemy camp saying, I'll go to war against God's people. The people he's supposed to be king over, he was willing to kill. This is really the lowest point in David's life. But as a young man, he steps up and says, you come at me with a sword, with a, a spear and a shield. I come to you in the name of the Lord. He'll deliver you into my hands today. It is a picture of representative warfare where there is two armies opposing one another and they send the best they have from each side. And whoever wins one-on-one, -on -one, the whole army experiences the same victory as their representative. It's one of the greatest pictures of Christ given in the Old Testament. David goes out and fights the enemy of God's people, slays him, hits him with the stone, cuts his head off, and goes to Jerusalem with his head. And this is, uh, that part's in the Bible, why he goes to Jerusalem. Why he goes is not specifically written, but I'm going to give you the Sean 113, what I think it is. I think he goes, and Paris said this a few years ago, he said, I think he went first and foremost because Jerusalem was inhabited by the Jebusites, and I think he went and held that head up and said, hey, you're next, boys. I believe that, I, that's too good not to be true, but this part's really too good not to be true. I think he went and he buried the head at a place called Golgotha, which is literally called the place of the skull. So Goliath of Gath, head is buried at Golgotha, the place of the skull, where approximately a thousand years later, a little bit more than that, a spike would be driven through that mountain. What did God promise the serpent in the garden? Yeah, yeah, they've, they've, 
you've, uh, you've uh, taken your best shot at humanity, but I'm sending a man. I'm sending a representative who will fight for them. I'm sending one who you will bruise his heel, but he will crush your head. Hallelujah. And at Calvary, if the head of Goliath is buried there, the place of the skull is what it literally means. A spike is driven through the place of the skull where his, the blood runs down his heel and drips on top of the place of the skull. We have a perfect picture of Jesus crushing the head of our enemy. My God. That's too good not to be true. <laughs> so David serves as the representative fighting against our enemy, what Christ would do at Calvary, fighting against our enemy and bringing victory for everyone in the camp. But we know he was not without his imperfections. And while the Bible says it was a time where the kings should be out for war, David was home. Sees Bathsheba on her roof and we know the story. Calls Bathsheba, commits adultery with Bathsheba, then calls her husband home and tries to cover it up when her husband is a better man at this instant. Amen. He sends him back into the field and scripture says it was premeditated murder. Under the Mosaic law, David should have been killed. Just because you're a king doesn't mean you're exempt of the law of God. Our status doesn't make us exempt from holiness. Every one of us. So David kills Uriah, and the prophet Nathan comes to him and says, Look it, I have a story for you. There's this man who had a field with many, many sheep, as far as the eye could see. And another man who had just one lamb. He loved it. The lamb sat at the table with him. He ate it with him. He fed him like a kid almost. He loved this. And a foreigner came into the rich man's house, and he didn't want to kill one of his sheep to feed the foreigner. So he went to this other man, and he took the one precious lamb that he had, and he took it from him, and he killed that lamb. And David stands up from the throne and says, where is this guy? I want him dead now. And Nathan points the finger at his face and says, David, you are the man. David melts, and in Psalm 51, we hear his cry for repentance. A man broken in his sin. This is the second person I want to talk to today. The first, those lost in sin, if you'll cry to him, he will meet you. The second, those living for God who have fallen in sin, if you'll cry to him, my God, he'll meet you. And David cries out and says, Lord, hide, not, hide your face from my sin. Blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a right spirit in me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. He, David not only asks for repentance, David starts asking for new covenant blessings. Don't take your presence from me. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. David is reaching into a covenant that he doesn't even belong to yet, and God still honors his prayer. My God, if you've fallen today, if you failed today, take a bath in Psalm 51, cry out to God, and then get up and say, Lord, restore unto me the salvation, the joy of my salvation, and move forward in Christ. He'll be there for the sinner. Go ahead, give him glory. Jesus Christ will meet the sinner that calls on his name, and Jesus Christ will meet the saint that has failed that will call on his name unto repentance. And the last people that he will meet that I want to talk about today are those who are actively living for him, and he shows up in a, tri a time of trial with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. David's son Solomon comes and he reigns, and after Solomon's reign, the nation is torn into two pieces, the northern kingdom Israel, the southern kingdom Judah, the northern kingdom never has a godly king reign on the throne. And in 722 B.C., Assyria comes and just destroys the northern kingdom because of idolatry. And in 605, a little over 100 years later, Babylon comes to Judah. And it's the first deportation where Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are taken into a foreign land because of idolatry. Listen, God is not obligated to... God is not obligated, if we look at America, God is not obligated to bless America because we have Christian heritage. 
God is not obligated to bless this land because we have Christians in our past. God is looking at the hearts who are living right now, the people who are here right now. And though he is patient, though he is long-suffering, we have to determine in my mind, I am going to be a man of God who's going to live for him. The church needs to wake up and say, I'm going to be a people who are going to live for him. But these people in Judah have fallen away, have lost sight of their God, and end up in captivity. Idol is established, and Nebuchadnezzar says, when you hear the music, I want you to bow. Three young men say, absolutely not. We're not bowing before you, not bowing before your idols. And Nebuchadnezzar, I want you to go back and look at this real quick with me. He says, first and foremost, who is the God that will deliver you? Who is the God who can save you from my hands? Just a few verses later, the same king that said, who is a God who can save you, is now saying there is no God like their God. This is the purpose of God being with his people. It's so that the world can look and say, there's no God like their God. This is the purpose of God showing up to the person who's crying in sin like Rahab, saying, Lord, save me. It's so that the world can see redemption and say, no God can save like that God. This is the purpose of those of us who have fallen and failed like David and have cried to him and found repentance. No God can restore and forgive like that God. And this is the purpose of us when we are faithful to obey him, to follow him, and to serve him. As Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego took a stand for him, it's so that the world can see no God can show up like their God. Him showing up in my life is not only for my benefit, it's for his glory. Him showing up, whether I'm in need of salvation, forgiveness, or boldness to take a stand, it's not just so that I can get that, it's so he can get glory for it. He will show up, though. He will show up. Look at this. This covers the spectrum of everyone. Lost in sin, my God will show up. He'll stop the most important thing in the world to come and save you. Broken in your sin, my God will show up and restore you. Restored unto him his, his, the joy of his salvation. And we go to Matthew. The New Testament starts with Jesus Christ, the son of David. This one who didn't stay in his sin, he cried out, Lord, forgive me, restore me. And he said, yes, I'll call the Savior of the world your son. I'll take Rahab, a sinner, a prostitute in a foreign land, and I'll put her in the lineage of the Savior. My God. And I'll take these three Hebrew boys who have taken a stand for me, who are already in a place of prominence, I'll give them a promotion in a foreign land. My God, he'll show up no matter where you find yourself, he'll be faithful to show up. And for how many this morning you can testify he has shown up? Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Time and time again, he has shown up. So this is what I want to challenge you with today as we close. This is what I want to challenge you with today. And actually, um, uh, could you come back and let's sing worthy of it all one more time here this evening, or this morning. This is what I want to challenge you with. The truth we have to present first he is there, and he will meet the sinner who cries, the saint who's been broken, or the saint that needs boldness to take a stand. He will meet you and show up. The reason for it, though, is so that his name will be glorified on all the earth. The reason for it is so that those around will look and say, what God can save like this? What God can restore like this? And what God can give grace and strength like this? What God can save a man from the fire? I just had my friend the other day was telling me, um, it's written in church history, and I believe it's in Fox's Book of Martyrs, that John the Beloved, I've heard this story, that he was boiled alive in oil. I had heard that story, and I, I, I mean, it makes me cringe just thinking about it. But what I did not know, and this is what Fox's Book of Martyrs and Jewish history records that, uh, testifies that they believe this is true, that when he was boiled alive in oil, he survived. He didn't die at that time. But it is said that when he was boiled, he came out without the scratch on him, without one mark on him. 
Just like these boys came out without the smell of smoke on them, it is believed that John came up out of that oil with not one ounce of, not one mark, not one burn. <laughs> the clothes still intact. <laughs> He's able to save. He's able to give strength. He's able to give you strength to take a stand. But the reason for it, and this is what I want to challenge you with this morning, the reason for it is so that your life can be a testament to give Him glory. The reason He shows up is because He loves you and wants to save you, but it's also so the world around you can look as Nebuchadnezzar did and say, there's no God like their God. I want the people around me in my life to look at my life and say, man, His God is alive. His God is real, and there's no God like the one that they serve. <laughs> Hallelujah. So would you stand with me this morning? Well, we're going to sing that, and we're going to declare that for a few moments here before a pastor comes up to close. And I just want to challenge you, if you've experienced that today, if you can look, and I saw almost all of your hands go up and say, I've experienced that before. I know what it's like to have Jesus Christ show up when I need him. Then my challenge to you today is it's time to live like him. Live like he showed up to save you. Live like your life is different than it was before. Live like he has shown up and forgiven you. And you have a merciful God who not only forgives, but gives grace and gives strength to walk in liberty over that. And live like you have a God who will fill you with boldness to take a stand for Jesus Christ. And to be obedient to what he's called you to. My challenge to you today, he's with you always. Are we living like it though? So let's declare that for a few moments here today. And just commit our life to him today. Lord, I love you. I thank you for showing up. And I'm going to live like it and let my life be a testimony.
heard an old timer, well, they used to sing a song, I guess. I imagine Brother Sean's heard it. They sung that old song, said they wouldn't bend, they wouldn't bow, and they wouldn't burn. <laughs> and if you'll not give in, I'll tell you what, God will bring you through the fire no matter what. You know, he never promised we wouldn't have to go through the fire, but he promised That's right. we'd go through it. He'd come back. And Daniel was so in line then. And guess what? God will to shut the lion's mouth. Yes. He'll, he'll, he'll show up. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Give him one more praise. Thank you, brother. Give him one more praise.